Good evening, everyone. My name is Heather Barta. I am the coordinator of Province 5 of the Episcopal Church. Tonight, we are gathered as we transfer the World Day Against Trafficking in Persons to August 1st. This is a day declared to be July 30th of every year, but we are here today on August 1st, 2022. Province 5 is honored to be hosting this opportunity to come together to pray and to learn more about trafficking in persons. Uh, as you know, this is being recorded, uh, the prayer service part, and then the presentation will be recorded for review for those and available. Uh, we are so glad that you took time this evening to join us. Thank you for taking this time. Thank you for being part of this event. I would like to introduce Sandy Luther, who is going to tell us a little bit more. Thank you. Again, the, the trafficking against persons is uh, usually honored on July 30th. This year's theme is use and abuse of technology. With a global expansion in the use of technology, intensified by COVID-19 pandemic and the shift of our everyday life to online platforms, the crime of human trafficking has conquered cyberspace. The internet and digital platform offer traffickers numerous tools to recruit, oh, exploit, control victims, organize their transport and accommodations, advertise victims and reach out to potential clients communicate among perpetrators and hide criminal proceeds and all that with greater speed, cost effectiveness and anonymity. Moreover, technology shows these criminals to operate internationally across jurisdictions and evade detection with greater yeah. ease. Traffickers use social media to identify, groom Morning. and recruit Noon. victims including children, emails, and messaging services are used for the moral coercion of the victims. And online platforms show traffickers to widely advertise services provided by victims, including child photographically material. Crisis situations can also intensify this problem. Criminals profit from the chaos, desperation, and separation of people particularly women and children, from support systems and family members. For people on the move, online resources can become a trap, especially when it comes to phony travel arrangements, fake job offers, targeting vulnerable groups. However, in the use of technology also lies great opportunity. Future success in eradicating human trafficking will depend on how law enforcement criminal justice systems, and others can leverage technology in their responses, including by aiding investigations to shed light on the modus operandi of trafficking networks. Uh, excuse me, I just lost my place. Okay. Enhancing um, investigation aiding investigations to shed light on modus operandi of trafficking networks, enhancing prosecutions through digital evidence to alleviate the situation of victims in criminal proceedings and providing support services to survivors. Prevention and awareness raising activities on the safe use of the internet and social media could help mitigate the risk of people falling victim of trafficking online. Cooperation with the private sector sector is important to harness innovation and expertise for development of sustainable technology-based solutions to, to support prevention and combat combating of human trafficking. Let us pray for the end of human trafficking. May we be blessed 
with a discomfort with easy answers, half truths, and superficial relationships, but that our lives have depth and vision. May we be blessed with courage to confront injustice and exploitation of people so that we work for justice and peace. May we be blessed with tears to shed for those who suffer so that we reach out to comfort them, to turn their pain into joy. May we be blessed with enough faith and foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world and do what others claim cannot be done. A reading from Lamentations. Oh God, remember what has happened to us. Consider and see our degradation. The women in Zion have been raped the young girls in the town of Judah. Both have been put to the mill. Boys stagger under loads of wood. Joy has vanished from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. Matthew 19, 13 to 14. Then the little children were being brought to him in order that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples spoke sternly to those who brought them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. From Mark's gospel, then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me let us pray for open hearts we pray for open hearts to see the consequences of politics and economics that cause poverty Compassionate God, hear our prayer. We pray for open hearts to see how desperate people are vulnerable to exploitation. Compassionate God, hear our prayer. We pray for open hearts to hear the cries for help from exploited men, women, and children. Compassionate God, hear our prayer. We pray for open hearts to support those who reach out to help the victims of child labor. Compassionate God, hear our prayer. We pray for open hearts so that our eyes see, our ears hear, our minds engage, and our wills shape action. Compassionate God, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God of compassion and justice, open our hearts to pray, your kingdom come. With such passion that our lives become part of the answer to our prayer, so that your will is done on earth as in heaven. Amen. Marilyn Cassidy is a judge of the Cleveland Municipal Court of Ohio. She joined the Cleveland Municipal Court in June of 2007 after being appointed by well, uh, sorry, Governor Cass. Judge Cassidy was elected to full term commencing in 2008 and was re-elected in 2015. She resumed the office in 2020. The current term ends in 2026. She received her bachelor's degree from Syracuse University and her JD from Cleveland Marshall College. Judge Cassidy chairs the Cleveland Municipal Court Human Trafficking Special Document, which 
assist the survivors and trafficking to recover by providing trauma to recover, housing, addiction recovery services, and other support services. Currently, she has about 20 women in her fly program. Short for Freedom, Live, and You. The fly program is in the Ohio Supreme Court Certified Special Justice in 2014. It is an alternative to the National Criminal Justice Method. The trauma-based program addresses the needs of the victim of human trafficking. Upon completion of the program, the victims are eligible to expunge their record for any offenses that occur during the period of victimization. I am glad that Marilyn is with us tonight. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Judge Marilyn Cassidy. Um, from the Cleveland Municipal Court. I'll just give you a little brief background about me before I begin. I, um, I was raised in the Methodist Church and um, I now attend, uh, my personal bailiff's husband is a pastor at an AME church, so I attend AME church. Um, a lot of the hymns are the same and we like to sing. Um, uh, my undergraduate degree is in nursing, and so I got a really good uh, background and experience, uh, I mean, with a lot of uh, health issues, but also with addiction and mental health, which has really helped me a great deal in my service to the community and the municipal court. Um, and so I, I guess I'll just jump right in. Um, I. I uh, have handled, I handled a general docket for two years for the court. And then um, after the first two years, I began hearing a dedicated domestic violence docket. Uh, a dedicated domestic violence docket is one where um, the prosecutors, the court, the defense attorneys uh, and victim advocates all have special training, uh, advanced training in domestic violence in uh, those dynamics. And um, there was a judge in Columbus, um, Judge Herbert, who's since retired, but he kind of got this ball rolling in Ohio where he, he saw some um, domestic violence victim or some domestic violence victims and some defendants who looked more like victims. And you know, when you start asking the questions and taking a look at the bigger picture, um, you know, it fit pretty well into the um, into the framework of human trafficking. And so um, Judge Herbert started a specialized docket in Columbus. And uh, so we paid a visit to Columbus. Um, as a municipal court, we see misdemeanor crime. I do almost, you know, 99% criminal work. And so we thought because prostitution is one of the uh, crimes that we see, it would be a good place to start screening to see if we could find um, survivors or current victims. And that is what we did. We had to learn how to do it. Um, so um, there, is a, there is a tool, it's called the TVIT, Trafficking Victim Identification Tool. It's a clinical tool uh, and it is administered by a clinician. It is not administered by me. It is not administered by probation. It is administered by clinicians for more counseling. Um, <clears throat> if we have someone that we, you know, suspect may be um, a victim, and the way we the way we sort of identify that is either through the charge, if it's soliciting. Uh, low-level drug charges, petty theft. There's a lot of different, we actually have someone coming to us with a driving under suspension that I don't know how the judge knew, uh, but apparently she's got some real serious problems. So she referred that person to us. Um, so I thought, let's talk first about what is a specialized docket because, you know, if you've ever been to court, you know, for a traffic ticket or one of those things, you know, the court calls your name, you come up, you plead guilty, not guilty, no contest, and the court imposes a sentence. They impose a fine or probation or, or something like that. 
and that's how court worked for years and years and years. And even when I first began, when I saw um, women charged with soliciting, I would put them on probation. I would give them a chance to go to treatment. Um, I would say probably every single one of them uh, was not compliant with the probation program. And then I'd just execute days in jail and you know they'd be back out on the street. The specialized docket model, um, you may have heard of drug courts. We have drug courts nationwide. Certainly our court has a drug court. The Court of Common Pleas in Cuyahoga County has a drug court. And that is a specialized docket model. And it is, the model is more of a treatment court. It is, uh, it is a, a team approach where um, it's non-adversarial, where the prosecutor isn't out to hammer the defendant and the defense attorney and the prosecutor aren't fighting the whole time. Um, we meet as a team with clinicians um, an hour before court meets and we go over each individual's case. Um, what, I'm sorry, can you hear? Okay. Um, we go over each individual's case. We staff it. If there's a, if there's a mental health worker, the mental health worker is there. Um, the case manager is there. And we hear about either they're making good progress uh, in treatment or they're not making good progress. And so we talk about what we can do to support that individual through the rest of the program. Um, that's the difference between a specialized docket program and just a regular court docket. And uh, so our program is two years, which is a pretty long time. When people hear that, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't possibly do it. Um, and we have had women um, who you know, are assigned to the docket. And they, of course, when they're in jail, they want to be a part of anything you suggest. And um, what we've learned is that trauma, you know, we're, de we're dealing with trauma more than anything else. I mean, of course, we have addiction. Many of them have addiction issues. And uh, I would say almost 100% of them also have a mental health diagnosis. And so we are addressing a lot of things at once. But what we learned is that we have to address all these things globally. You, you cannot put a traumatized uh, woman on, on a uh, give her some bus tickets and say, go to your uh, counseling appointment Monday morning and then take the bus across town and meet with the housing people. And it just doesn't work. Um, and traumatized people also, um, they run because that's how they've stayed alive. They're not problem solvers. Um, so when uh, if we assign a, a woman who's part of the docket to treatment and she leaves the jail and goes to treatment and then leaves after you know a week or two months or whatever it is and she uh, you know goes off our radar um, they always turn up and I'm happy when they turn up alive uh, and not overdosed on uh, opioids <clears throat> and when they come back we offer them the opportunity to come again uh, and so we do not have, uh, like many drug courts will have last chance agreements where if you're messing up and not doing what you're supposed to do, they'll cut you out of the program. For trauma, we really try not to do that. Um, we've had one woman, um, her name is Cece, and she was in her 60s. She must, I, I must have seen her, you know, seven or eight times and she'd be in the jail and I'd go, oh my gosh, here she is again. And she'd always say, yeah, I'll do it. And then she'd run away. And she wound up being one of our star graduates. She went to the White House um, and spoke with the president at one point in a, a press conference. I mean, it was really, really impressive stuff. And it's so gratifying to see that, you know, by, uh, by keeping that door open um, and giving people a chance, you're building trust. And um, that's what um, probably all of these women need. We know um, before anybody even walks through our door, we have a pretty good uh, profile of, at least for women. And I know, um, you know, we talk about labor trafficking, which is, of course, present in Ohio. Um, I see mostly sex trafficking. 
uh, I see entirely stuff, sex trafficking. I have not yet seen a victim of labor trafficking, although we would, we would assist those people also. Um, the profile is um, usually um, female because it's the females who get arrested. Um, a female who, you know, from childhood has witnessed violence, been abused, usually sexually abused, sexually assaulted. Um, and, you know, from there it just gets worse and worse. And so um, when they come into us, they do not self identify as victims or survivors at all. I mean, I, I explained to a group once uh, that was one of the first groups we had in. I said, here's what we know about people uh, like you who come in through the door and this is what we see uh, and this is what trafficking is. And one of the la ladies raised her hand and she said, well, does it happen here? So they don't know. Uh, uh, a person who's a victim of trafficking is not very likely to come running uh, you know, to your door and say, oh my gosh, can you please get me away from him? Um, because when I first started, I, I'm a very transparent judge. I like to have open court and I permitted open court. And I quickly realized that their pimps would come and sit next to them uh, because I had their property. And um, so I put a stop to that pretty quickly. And, um, and I required, I, the law does permit uh, me for the safety of my participants to close the courtroom. And then if anyone wanted to wait for their friend on my floor, they had to show an ID. And if they didn't wanna show an ID, then they could wait downstairs on the first floor. And I always had, at the time we started, the investigator from the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office um, at the time was Brian Vigna, a retired FBI agent. And he, he would check every one of those IDs and you know figure out if that was somebody they were looking for. So we had a really good relationship with the County Prosecutor's Office. I wish we still had that. I believe there is still a grant funded investigator, but we just don't see him, he doesn't come to our hearings, I could always send him information um, if I have it. But um, anyway, so we closed court. And um, I think that helped with the success for the women, they had a safe place. And um, I always tell them the model we use actually for treatment, and when I say we, I mean our clinicians, I don't participate in any treatment. Um, we do try to make our courtroom um, uh, trauma competent. So um, when we are in the courtroom, um, before COVID, you know, we would always have a tray of cookies, a big pot of coffee. So as the women would come in, they could have a cup of coffee and a little snack and talk to each other. And even the women from the jail, when they were brought up, you know, they would get a cup of coffee and a cookie and get to talk to people and um, try to let them see this is a safe place. I don't use jail as a sanction very much. We use incentives more, but a part of a specialized docket is incentives and sanctions. So that when, um, when women complete, uh, we have three phases. Phase one is usually um, addiction treatment. If they complete that, then they're into phase two and they're looking more at um, you know, living, uh, you know, living every day, maybe aftercare, and then phase three would be, um, you know, are they going to get their own place, and how are they making decisions, because that's really uh, good decision making is how people finish the program, and none of them are problem solvers. We have to teach them how to solve the problems, and, and it's been, you know, it's been pretty effective. I'm sure we can keep getting better at it, but I will say um, this, uh, we've also added equine therapy to the program. So the women go um, to Hope Meadows, which is in Bath, Ohio, um, and they uh, work with the staff there. Again, there's a clinical staff, there's staff for the horse, staff for the, uh, for the participant, uh, and they, they are able to do, learn a lot about making decisions and feelings through working with the horses which is, uh, uh, they have just loved that and it's been pretty effective for them. So 
we're happy we can offer all of those things. I think we've probably had about 20 women finish the program, a two-year program. We just graduated two in June. It's been a little more difficult with uh, COVID. You know, we've had to do Zoom meetings just like everybody else. Um, although we, you know, we were just ready to have everybody uh, come back to court and then the Justice Center went on some high alert thing again and we just said we're not, you know, we'll just wait until things settle down a little bit. We're back on high alert now. So um, it's been uh, a really um, challenging experience to work with these women. Um, I, will, I can tell you that, um, you know, when, I, when we first started as incentives, um, just, I mean, we clap for people if they've had, you know, however many days sober they are, we give them a hand. And then um, I used to, if I went to a baby shower or a wedding shower and they had the little paper containers and you fill them with candy, I used to take them at the end if there were some left over, I was the worst guest ever. And I would take them and we'd give them out as incentives. And you would have thought you were giving this person the most valuable gift in the world. They were so excited to get this little, you know, glittery box of candy. And it, it just doesn't really take much, uh, except, you know, the fact that telling the women you are worthy, you are worthy of everything we do in this program. You are worthy of a wonderful life. You deserve everything life has to offer because at some point, someone in their lives showed them that they were not. So I try to make it a point to let them know that we, we as a team believe they're worthy, that I believe they're worthy. And when we are in the courtroom, uh, I typically come in, I don't wear a robe and we have a musical little, we have a little musical intro about it's, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember the musician, but anyway, so I go through, I shake hands with all the women, the ones that want to be touched. Some of them may not want to be, that's okay. Um, but you know, when is the, when have they ever been in court and the judge came over and shook their hand and asked them how they were, you know? So we try to, um, we try to make our courtroom a safe place. And I do let them know, even when they finish the program, um, that they um, certainly are welcome to come back to our meetings, that this is a safe place if they would ever need one. You know, unfortunately we're not there weekends, but we can at least be there when we're there for them. So I don't know, how am I doing on time? You're doing great. Should, I mean, I, I can talk more, I can take questions. I thought I saw one question there. Yep, there are a couple um, questions who that okay. popped up. Um, so is there anything that you'd like, because, well, I'll ask these questions and then if somebody wants to ask a question, we can okay. talk about wrapping things up uh, and stopping the recording. Uh, one okay. question is how many people have completed your program since its inception? I think you answered it sort of right after she asked About it. 20, about 20, yeah. It's, yeah, we're not, we're not drug court. We're, it takes, it's a, takes a lot to get through this program, but the young women, are, they're not all young. But the women who have completed it have done a great job and they're out there, you know, living their best life. And that makes us happy. Fabulous. Can volunteers provide or donate incentives for your participants? Um, yes, they can. Although I would suggest if that's something you want to do that, um, that we wait until, because we, we're still doing Zoom. And it's, um, it's pretty hard for us, we, you know, we have to have a clinician or a case manager, somebody drive around to the various places uh, where the women live. A lot of them live in Jordan House, which is um, kind of transitional housing for women who are, you know, just released from prison or, you know, on probation, that type of thing. Um, a lot of them live there, but not all of them. So, um, you know, we would absolutely enjoy just any kind of little trinkets or if you, you know, we typically we give them something for Christmas. Also, we give them, um, you know, hat and mittens or just, you know, a little something. We wrap it up pretty so everybody gets something. And if, if that's something you're interested in doing, I mean, we don't have I wouldn't I'd say we probably have no more than uh, 15, probably 15 people active at any time, because even though people say they want to be part of the program, 
they may get sent to treatment and then their capia status if they leave they turn up eventually but they may not you know we don't have everybody that's ever been documented in our courtroom at one time so it doesn't need to be a lot just any any kind of little thing you think might be nice um we of course would appreciate very very much and the women i will tell you um i are are so grateful um for for the uh for the love they get from the community and i uh, at one graduation, when we, uh, again, before COVID, we all get, you know, we have cake and punch and we get flowers and a little uh, necklace or something for them. And uh, one of the women said, well, I just, I'm so excited that there's all these law enforcement people in the room and not one of them is looking for me. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, and it sounds funny to us, but it's, you know, that's the, that's the trans, that's part of the transition they're going through. I mean, it's really, really a huge, huge turnaround. They get jobs, you know, they're, some of them, uh, you know, have worked at um, various restaurants around town or uh, Amazon has been a great employer. And, um, you know, they don't all have, they don't, they still have their criminal record when they're, before they finish the program. So to get hired and to do a good job, I mean, that's just really, really something that's very important. Um, and uh, we've been happy to see it happen yeah on behalf of the people here i mean the what you've described and the work that you're doing uh is just so valuable and life-changing um i think that there are people who live close to you who may be able to help us as you get back in per person that they can help us right. know when we can send you incentive gifts um, that would be awesome yeah, there are some more questions. Uh, so is there a mentorship program with graduates and those currently in the program? Um, not a formal one yet, but um, some of the women go on to do, in fact, the one I was telling you about, I think she's going to school to get um, a full counseling license because she's gotten her record cleared up. So she's able to do that. But we do encourage that. We encourage the women who have finished the program to come back and um, you know, share time with the women who are going through it and, um, you know, and to hear from someone that said, hey, I ran away eight times and look at me now. I've got my own place. I've got a job. I'm going to school. You know, we have women get their children back, which is just also something that's extremely gratifying. I think we've had also we've had pregnant women that, you know, gave birth to healthy babies because they were in the program. And um, you know their baby was born healthy, and I know the Hitchcock Center allows women with babies and children to live there and recover and to live there kind of open ended um, until they find a place and a, a, a more stable place. Um, I think you know one of the problems I have uh, with just our community as a whole, it's not just Cleveland, is that when women are ready to get their own place. Um, there, they a lot of them go are looking at public housing, and to me, that's returning the person to the belly of the beast because there's so much drug activity and criminality in public housing. So we have now, because we are grant funded, we are able to uh, help with um, first month's rent. So even if you have a you know a modest job, if if you're working at McDonald's or you're working at Burger King, which some of our women have done and done very well at still hard to get that first month's rent and then you know uh to put down and then um or one month's rent and then the first month's rent so we're able to help with that and um so those women we just when they graduate we keep them on probation a little bit longer so we can um pay their first month's rent for them uh through the grant and um uh, like I said, it's that's been that's been good, and then I also have been able to join uh, a local board, uh, a, a very small little nonprofit. And what we're looking at doing is helping women. I guess it's not we wouldn't call it transitional housing. I think we would call it almost more like supported living. Um, so they're in the community, maybe have a, ch a place to live with their children, maybe even an opportunity to to um, buy or can rent it at full price, uh, sliding scale and supportive services, almost like a campus. So they had childcare right there and medical close by. And 
Um, this way they're, they're not going back to public housing, but they're moving forward. And um, because we had one go back to public housing and die, which is it's always disturbing when we, we've had several women die from overdoses. Yeah, that part's hard. Well, you know, but I will say um, I and our team and the women appreciate your prayers. We appreciate your support um, because, you know, this is not something anybody can do alone. And um, the women are given an opportunity to attend church if they want to. They don't have, I mean, of course, as a court, we can't make them go. Um, but uh, when I when I was campaigning, I went to one church, um, a church where one of our clinicians uh, uh, attends, and there was I didn't even know it. And there in the back were some of our women. They're like, "Judge, you're here today," and you know, it was it was just really nice to see. And um, so, thank you for your concern. Thank you for your awareness. Thank you for your prayers. Um, uh, I can't, there's no money to be accepted for the program. I probably, sh I can start a nonprofit, but really, I would say if you want to donate money somewhere uh, to support uh, trafficking, I would say um, the Renee Jones Empowerment Center is local and um, they do good work with women who are survivors of human trafficking. Um, Polaris Project is a national project. They also do a lot of work. Um, and there are smaller local places. And again, almost every single one of these people, they have uh, trauma, mental health diagnosis, and addiction. So any type of program that you support in, in those areas, you're, go you're going to be helping somebody that's been trafficked. Those resources are really helpful. I'll include those in the follow-up email. Um, okay. I just saw, I just, it flashed up on my screen. I didn't see the whole question. Is there some critical number of people going through, uh, going through something, oh, CA court to justify need for a similar court? Jenna, did I you miss mean, something there? A specialized docket in a different jurisdiction, you mean? I mean, are the numbers there? Is that the question? The question is um, how many, like, is there a critical number of cases that would kind of be appearing to make it worthwhile for another jurisdiction to open up a similar docket court? Well, I can tell you this now, we weren't sure about that. We were sort of worried about that. We're like, well, what if we don't have the numbers? Okay, and believe me, the numbers are there. Now we are an urban court, okay? Now, human trafficking happens everywhere. Whether or not there's enough uh, numbers to support a specialized docket in a rural area, I don't know. But I would say, listen, anywhere, you know, there's trafficking and, well, just taking our community, for those of you that live here, it happens in the suburbs. Anytime you have any, any kind of those corporate parks with hotels there, it's happening in those hotels. It's happening everywhere. And, um, you know, you just don't hear about it. You sometimes you hear when there's a big trafficker that gets busted, but you sure don't hear about the victims and the victims are the ones who get arrested. Um, that's been sort of one of my goals with a new mayor in Cleveland. Um, men really very seldom get arrested in our city. And it's a three prong problem. You have, you know, you have uh, the trafficker, you have the victim and you have the consumer. Adolescents, that ju our juvenile court has a, has its own um, program. So anyone, uh, we see people 18 and over, adults, and our our juvenile court in Cuyahoga County has had uh, it's called Safe Harbor Program uh, for juveniles. And believe me, juveniles are uh, definitely trafficked as young as their average age of recruitment is 13. It's the second second largest criminal enterprise behind either drugs or um, illegal firearms, depending on whose numbers you read. It's a huge, the only reason people do it is money. That's it, to make money. And there's a lot of money being made in this business. So our area of province five includes, you know, Ohio all the way over to Missouri and, um, and Wisconsin. 
So mm -hmm. I know that you're based out of and have experience in Ohio. How do we find out about other resources across our area if we're not in Cleveland or Ohio? Well, I think you can, um, if you're looking for human trafficking resources, if you're looking for specialized dockets, um, there, I would contact the um, highest, for example, in Ohio, the Ohio Supreme Court uh, basically supervises all attorneys, judges, and courts. So our court is certified, our program is certified by the Ohio Supreme Court. You can contact your highest court and say, what specialized dockets do we have in our state? That's a, a public record. It's easy to find out. And then you can, you know, we, for example, our court has drug court, mental health court, veterans court, and um, fly the human trafficking court. So we have four in Cleveland. Um, just, and those are all certified by the Ohio Supreme Court. They know about it. If you contacted the, the highest court in your jurisdiction, that's easy information to get. Thank you. I, I think you answered the question about adolescent. Any right, other- we, That would be juvenile court. Is it, is possible, it possible to, to lobby for starting a special docket? It, listen, it never hurts. I, what I would suggest is, um, and again, you know, in Ohio, judges run for office. Um, but I would contact the administrative judge in my jurisdiction and just say, you know, what, if anything, um, are your courts doing to address this problem? And they may have any, I'm, I'm sure. It, I'm sure they have an answer, but you could ask, is there a specialized docket for survivors of human trafficking? Is it something you've considered? Is it something you would consider? See what they say. So is that lobbying? I, I kind of is. Takes a special, you know, not every judge is cut out to do specialized docket work, but Again, we have 13 judges in the general division of our court and we have four, four specialized dockets. So four of us do it um, and you know, not everyone wants to do it. You get some smaller courts or one or two judges. Now we can take cases from any mu uh, municipality in Cuyahoga County. So we get cases from Rocky River, we get cases from Lyndhurst, we get cases from all over the place. So yes, I would definitely ask the question. You could write a letter, send an email to the administrative judge and just say, you know, this is a problem I'm concerned about in our community. Do we have any specialized dockets at our court and what are they? And if not, would you consider it? And, you know, there are plenty of resources for courts. I just came back from the uh, National Association of Drug Court Professionals National Conference every year and they teach judges judges, probation officers, clinicians, everybody. They teach us all what to do and how to do it, best practices. Oh, sadly, the response was no HT case has- Human trafficking. Yeah, is this what um, a judge said or is that, was that what the question was asked of a judge and that's what the judge said, we don't have it here? Yes, that no prosecutor had ever brought a case. Well, and I laughed. Well, listen, that may be very true, but you have to identify the victims first. You have to identify the victims. And we're not, our court is about um, helping survivors recover and return to a productive, happy life. Now, in some cases, we've had women who were. Um, in, in the captivity of big, huge traffickers that were since prosecuted. And we've had women that were supposed to testify in those cases and that sort of thing. Thing is, it's there, but you have to look for it. Nobody's gonna come to the prosecutor's office and say, this man had me locked up in uh, a closet uh, and addicted, you know, what they do is they addict these women to um, drugs and tell them that if you need more, then you've got to go out and do, do this much work, do what I tell you, and they get beaten and everything else. So 
I'm sorry to hear that. I don't know where that was. I had a conversation at this conference with a common pleas judge from Scranton, PA, and he told me we don't have it there. I said, well, yes, you do, Josh. Yes, you do. You got to look. Um, again, there's um, the Collaborative to End Human Trafficking is a local resource here. They do great community education. I'm sure they do a program. But you're right, judges need education. I still have colleagues in my court who look at soliciting charges as, uh, you know, that's a consensual activity between a man and a woman. So what if there's money? You know, for all the, you know, for all the talking and educating I've tried to do, I, you know, you can only, that's why we need prayer in groups like you. <laughs> I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, oh, Lake County. That's where that was. Huh. Oh, well, they've had they've had they've had labor trafficking in Lake County. I, I think she just private messaged that to you. Oh, OK. Sorry. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine with you hearing everybody hearing I it. I, I don't care. I mean, well, just remember, just remember those people have to run to keep their jobs. And I know, but I, sadly, I, there is there's no venue to ever have these discuss. Like, there's not they don't politic for the same way a politician does. They don't run the well, same way a politician does. Well, so I will find out how to do that. I, yeah, I, I don't know how things. I don't know how things work in Lake County. Um, you know, I've run I've run in Geauga County once a million years ago. I lost, but um, you know, the thing is, I think there should be a forum for people to present issues and ask questions. And I, I, I am happy that in our county that happens quite a bit. I'm not sure that that happens in Lake County with judges, but I think I will begin pushing for that. Write some letters. You betcha. Thank you. Okay. This has been very helpful. <laughs> Give them my number. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Sure, my work. My work number. I was going to say, careful, we're going to give everyone your number now. <laughs> no, no, my no. Work number. That's public <laughs> record. But well, no, uh, I, like I said, I really appreciate the work that you are all doing and appreciate the prayers. And so do the women because they need it, believe me. And sometimes I do too. <laughs> yeah. Some days well, are better than others. On behalf of Province 5, we are so very grateful for your time tonight. Thank you for joining us for this time. And um, we will, there, there's much applause happening in the background. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I, uh, I'd be happy to give you any further resources. Anybody you want speaking, I'd be happy to give you a few ideas. That'll be great. We'll be in touch and okay. we'll continue to send that information out via our um, newsletter. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.